but the one who by her graces and her gifts was the most exquisite of them all was soon to disappear and her loss was to be one of the cruelest blows and kind fate ever dealt to me. Since her husband's death and my return from Holland, Adele had remained constantly with me. She devoted herself to her duties as friend and comforter. All her time was given up to the delicate attentions she lavished on me, her efforts to encourage my drooping spirits, and the numberless charitable acts she performed on behalf of all sorts of unfortunate people. Often I have seen her take off a brilliant court dress and abandon pleasures that would have seemed to many to be altogether absorbing in order to take alms to beggars living in the most miserable hovels. She had accompanied me to X. Together we went to look at a waterfall. I crossed the stream first on an unsteady plank. As I turned, what a tragic spectacle met my eyes. Great God, could it be true? My friend swept away from the current, vanished beneath my very eyes. I succeeded only later in recovering her inanimate body. The officers of my household, my servants, attempted to drag me away from the scene where the tragedy had taken place. I would not leave. In spite of everything, I would not give up all hope, yet I knew it was fruitless. She had departed. Anguish filled my bosom. I found myself suddenly more utterly alone than ever. Now that I had been robbed of that friend who helped me endure my sufferings, the thought of the future terrified me. No longer would I have her mind to support my fainting spirit. No more would I have her gentle nature to calm the tempestuous emotions of my own character. I accused Providence of treating me unjustly, and I accused myself of having insisted too constantly on my own troubles to this incomparable friend and having never made it clear enough to her how dear she was to me. I felt it in the past. I had indeed been selfish since then. At least she had been by my side. My mother, when she heard what happened, wished to hurry to me. She guessed the extent of my sorrow and sent her chamberlain, Comte de Turpin, to inquire as to my health. The Empress Marie Louise also wrote me a letter sympathizing with me in my misfortune. Everyone shared my sorrow because everyone loved the person whose loss made me so unhappy. But for me, what consolation was there? I founded a hospital at X with Sisters of Charity to attend to the sick people. I had the body of my unhappy friend laid at rest in a chapel at St. Lou. Thus, I kept her near me. I could not heal the pain this dreadful loss had caused me, but I sought to assuage it by acts of charity. I felt that I was helping her by imitating her example. On my return to St. Lou, my mother brought me my children. Her affectionate care touched me but could not console me. I went to Paris to see Adele's father, and her sisters, Madame Camo and Marichal Ney. Our interview was a heart-rendering one. Madame Cabet, who was also inconsolable, she felt it in losing this pupil whom she had brought up and of whom she was so proud she had lost a daughter. After all, it was I who had suffered the most grievous loss. See, Bess, who prescribed me for my health. I went to Dieppe with my children, with whom I could no longer bear to be separated. They were all I still cared for in life, or at least the only beings who still needed me. King Joseph, having been obliged to abandon his Spanish kingdom, had retired to his country estate at Mortefontaine. I made of him a visit there. The queen shared his retirement. She was admiral in her gentleness, kindness of heart, and self-abnegation. She shared my indifference to rank and position, and like me, had found they failed to bring her happiness. Her husband, whose character was totally unlike that of Louis, made her unhappy but from quite different reasons. Without any respect for her and solely interested in other women, he neglected her and even was frequently rude to her. Her domestic sorrows reminded me of what I had endured so long. The sight of this unhappy woman living as though she were in a prison recalled me to myself. I remembered the advice of my friend when she reproached me for not appreciating more fully the pleasures that I still possessed. I felt that I had been punished for this little attitude and I turned toward my children whose dearly loved beings who needed my care and my energy. At least I said, I shall bring them up as I think best. I am free to spend my time as I see fit. I am unable to weep undisturbed. Although life may not be pure joy, at least it is no longer altogether painful. May Providence spare me and not punish me because I demand too much and because I remembered only the suffering it has inflicted on me. These thoughts and the public events which made it necessary for me to be brave helped me attain that state of resignation in which, while we do not forget our misfortunes, we yet find the strength to bear them. While at Mortefontaine, I saw the Queen of Westphalia, whose hub husband made her happy and who enjoyed to the fullest all the agreeable things life had to offer and which rank confers on you. The loss of her kingdom was the one blow 
which had ever fallen on her. And as she had everything else she could desire, the only thing that interested her was what went on in the fields of politics. Consequently, this is all we talked about. And we all agreed as to the need for a speedy peace. The emperor was at Dresden. We believed he could conclude negotiations there. Perhaps it was not in his power to do so. Perhaps he depended too much on the strength of his armies, on the resources of France, on the alliance with Austria, on his own good fortune. Did he fear that if he made any concession, he should be considered weak, and that if people formed this opinion, the hatred of his power, which till now had been suppressed, would burst out? Or did he feel himself defeated unless he imposed his own terms? Perhaps future, future generations will be able to decide where his fault lay and whether he should have made peace when the opportunity arose, since national pride had been satisfied at Lutzen and Bautzen. But England led, Austria followed. The emperor's subjects grew restless under a too continuous military domination. Kings on their thrones forgot who had placed them there. Soldiers in the field went over to the enemy, and the allies of yesterday became the enemies of today. People listened only to the voice of treason and sought to satisfy the promptings of revenge. The army, having been obliged to retire in the face of overwhelming numbers at Leipzig, withdrew to Mayence. On the way, it had to overcome all sorts of obstacles, which became constantly more numerous. The number of our enemies grew as our difficulties increased. Wherever the troops actually fought, they were victorious, but the only result was that they eventually found themselves on their native soil, obliged to defend it against the invaders. Hardly had they arrived when an epidemic broke out, which carried off a large number of those whom war had spared. The emperor returned to St. Cloud. He seemed entirely absorbed by negotiations for peace. France desired it. Worn out by her latest efforts, she seemed under, unwilling to undertake new ones. Her soldiers, exhausted by the setbacks, said they suffered during the last two campaigns, began to wonder if this was all the reward they could hope to obtain. The buoyancy of the days when they were constantly victorious vanished and discouragement took its place. Adherence to the Republican form of government, who had been obliged to remain silent so long as the country was prosperous, now began to make themselves heard and believed that the opposition party could obtain political concessions. It was not the moment they should have sought to secure them. That might have been done when France, having attained the highest point of her military glory, could have dreamed of still further perfecting her political system. At present, it was either too soon or too late. The approach of the invader should have united all parties for the defense of the country, and all powers should have been entrusted to the one man capable of doing this. But people were only conscious of how heavily this man's will had weighed in the balance of their destiny for many years. They had forgotten his gifts as a leader. This is a common enough mistake, but one which always proves fatal. What could be more harmful than this political division which placed us at the mercy of jealous and hostile forces? Our leader notwithstanding what might be considered his faults, was more likely to rescue us than a foreigner in spite of all the latter's fine promises. Thus the emperor found himself alone in his struggle against both his personal enemies and those of France. Had he received the same support as in the past, he might still have proved victorious. His brothers gathered round him. My husband, who had constantly refused to leave foreign territory, now that he saw these countries declaring war in France arrive to aid his efforts to those of the rest of the family, he again stayed with his mother. I did not see him once. When my husband had heard the decree of the foreign monarchs that France must surrender all territories beyond her natural frontiers, he believed that Holland could not fail to become again independent. And he had proposed to the emperor to withdraw his abdication and reassume the Dutch crown. The emperor had refused. Since the death of the Grand Marshal de Roque, that post had remained unoccupied. The emperor liked Monsieur de Flao and had been much pleased with his behavior on the different missions entrusted to him during the last campaign. He thought of appointing him to this post. The Duke de Rovigo, who considered that he was more or less entitled to it himself, spoke to the emperor about Monsieur de Flao's affection for me, which was generally known in Paris. The emperor wished his grand marshal to be someone entirely devoted to his own interests. He feared any influence that was not his own. He had entrusted Monsieur de Flao with a certain mission which required secrecy. The Duc de Rivigo called on me and in the course of our conversation looked at me fixedly while speaking of this mission as though I must know what he was referring to. Although little accustomed 
to concealing my thoughts. I was obliged to make an effort to appear entirely ignorant of what he meant in order not to injure the prospects of the man who kept nothing for me. I suspected that this little stratagem had been employed to discover how deeply Monsieur de Flao took me into his confidence. Finally, Savary remained head of the police and the emperor appointed General Bertrand, who was already his aide-de-camp, Grand Marshal of the Palace. Everyone approved of his choice, for Bertrand was a gifted man, unpretentious in his manner, kind-hearted, loyal, and upright. He had married a Mademoiselle Dillon, who was related to my family. I had made the match at St. Louis, and my almoner, the Bishop of Osmond, had blessed their union. Mademoiselle Dillon was high-spirited, with lofty moral standards and a nobility of heart, very demonstrative in all her feelings. She was particularly so, as regarded her violent affection for her husband. The happiness of their marriage was proof of the fact that contrasting characters are not an obstacle to domestic joy. In the meanwhile, nothing more was heard about an approaching peace, which was what everyone was hoping for. France was uneasy. The political parties were becoming active again. In order to compel them all to share his views, the emperor in the past had used violence. When arguments did not succeed, he used force, and force succeeded. The young men belonging to the former nobility who were obliged to enlist against the wishes of their parents became our partisans from the moment they shared the glory of the new regime. In the present instance, however, neglecting the older members of that nobility, which he neither needed nor feared, the emperor called to the colors all the youths belonging to the richest and most influential families of France. His orders for this enforced draft were already severe. Unfortunately, the manner in which they were executed was even harsher and more inconsiderate. The result was the arousing of bitter animosities. Victories would have saved everything. Defeats envenomed all public complaints. The benefits of the lawgiver, the exploits of the general were speedily forgotten. People only remember the acts of a man ever anxious to conquer more territory. Even we, the members of his own family who were used to letting him dictate to us in everything, now dare to protest and blame him openly for continuing a war which perhaps he lacked the power of bringing to an end. The Prince of Benevento, Talleron, who for a long time had felt himself to be disgraced, recognized the weakness of the emperor's position and sought to take advantage of it. He had at his disposal the means of doing much harm, and he employed them all. A man who hates another but lacks courage to combat him openly rarely lets slip an opportunity for which he has long been secretly waiting. Meanwhile, the crusade of the northern races, allied to one another, at last set foot on the soil of France, which had so long remained inviolate. A panic such as never occurred before seized the capital. The enemy actually in France, where is our army? What forces can we oppose to such a formidable invasion? As a matter of fact, no steps had been taken to defend the city. I had gone to attend mass at the Tuileries. The Duchess de Montebello, apparently much alarmed, spoke to me saying, but damn, have you heard the news? The allied armies have crossed the Rhine. Paris is panic stricken. What can the emperor be doing? The empress whom the Duchess had informed of what was happening appeared to be much upset. I seem to attract misfortune wherever I go, she said to me. All those who have had anything to do with me, either intimately or at a distance, have suffered from this more or less. Since my childhood, I have constantly been obliged to escape hurriedly from where I happen to be. I returned in the evening to the family dinner party. The emperor was alone with the empress when I arrived. He was holding her in his arms and seemed to be teasing her. Ah, there you are, Hortense, he exclaimed laughingly as I entered. Are people as frightened as all that in Paris? Do you already see the Cossacks riding down the street? Well, they are not here yet, and we have not forgotten our trade as soldiers. Don't worry, he added, speaking to his wife. We will go again to Vienna to beat Papa Francis. At dinner, his son came in at dessert time. He repeated several times to the boy, come on and beat Papa Francis. And the child repeated this phrase so frequently and so clearly that the emperor seemed delighted and laughed heartily. After dinner, he sent for the Prince of Neuchâtel. Now then, Bertier, go over there, he said, pointing to his table covered with green cloth. We shall have to begin once more our campaign of Italy. The emperor dictated steadily for an hour as we sat there, speaking without any notes and outlining the way the army was to be organized, which was to assemble on the plains of Chalon. He sent for the four generals in command of the guard and inquired how many men were on sick leave, how many were available for active service. He paid particular attention to the reorganizing of this part of his forces. All this took time. Finally, he dismissed everyone and turning to us said, well, ladies, are you satisfied now? 
You think it's going to be as easy to catch us as all that? As the national finances were in difficulties, at the moment the emperor took the funds required for this new campaign from his private fortune. The method in which his household accounts were kept was so perfect that it might have served as a model to all the departments of the state. The emperor was extremely thrifty and his personal expenses very liberal where others were concerned. He frequently quoted the example of Charlemagne who sold even the herbs from his private garden and the emperor dismissed his chamberlain, Monsieur de Ramuza, from the post of controller of his wardrobe because the chamberlain had spent over 80,000 francs in a year on it. One day the emperor spoke to us all about this and said, can you imagine such a sum being spent on me who only wear an officer's undress uniform? That was why I told Monsieur de Turenne to look after my wardrobe expenses. I limited them to 24,000 francs per year and I do not intend to exceed the sum. As he was extremely particular about his linen and as he lost a great deal of it while at the front, Monsieur de Turenne was forced to resort to all sorts of expedients to keep within this figure. He even had pages run after the emperor's gloves if he happened to forget them in his carriages. It was by practicing such personal economy that the emperor was able to come to the rescue of his public treasury. He frequently made gifts of two or three hundred thousand francs to his marshals and generals in order to enable them to pay their debts or buy an estate or townhouse. Before I left for Holland, he attended a ball I gave at my house. You are not as elegant as the other princesses. Does not your husband make you a big enough allowance? Well, then I shall set aside a hundred thousand francs a year for you for my personal budget. Nevertheless, it may be mentioned that he kept his gifts within reasonable limits. The emperor's departure took place shortly after the scene I've just related. One morning, all the officers of the National Guard were summoned to the Salle de Marichaux. The emperor had the king of Rome brought in, took him in his arms and with the empress beside him and surrounded by the rest of his family, announced that he was leaving for the front and declared his confidence in the National Guard of Paris to whom he entrusted the defense of the capital and the protection of those who were dearest to him. The enthusiasm which greeted him was quite sincere, the more so as the position was a critical one and the interests of the individuals and the state both seemed to be entirely dependent on his military genius. I saw men's eyes fill with tears. And a few days later, the same men not only abandoned the imperial cause, but insulted the emperor in the most outrageous manner.